official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home Official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home From the heart inside one I vision fat licks and mat clips The chrome will make the average imitator do backflips You lack a pistol So put a vest around the issue Sluts will never miss you Coming from members that's official Today we're going to continue our discussion on optimistic concurrent control, or sorry, concurrent control pro protocols. Um, recall from last class, we spent time talking about two-phase locking, and that was the first. All right, so yeah, last class we talked about two-phase locking, all right, and that was a concurrent control protocol we would implement in our database system that would generate complex serializable schedules for us without having to know what queries the transactions were going to execute ahead of time, what operations they were going to do, what objects they were going to touch ahead of time. Right? And so the way to think about two-phase locking, it's a, what we'll call a pessimistic protocol, meaning I, the database system is going to assume that transactions are going to conflict. So therefore, it requires you to get the locks for the things you want to touch before you're allowed to touch them. Right? But it may be the case in some workloads and in some environments and some databases that conflicts are actually rare. Right? And furthermore, that most transactions are pretty short-lived. Most transactions are like jump in, begin the transaction, read and write a few number of things, and then commit, and you're done. Or write, read and write a few things, and you're done. Like we're talking maybe in the orders of milliseconds, at the most of seconds. So yes, there are transactions that can run for minutes, days, and hours, worst case scenario, weeks, right? But those, those, those are rare. Most transactions are in and out. Like think of like you loading a web page, that's a transaction. That's pretty fast. So therefore, if we assume that conflicts are going to be rare, and we assume that transactions will be short-lived, then it may not be a good idea to always require them, always require transactions to acquire locks before they start running, because if I don't think they're going to conflict, why acquire locks? So a better protocol might be try to optimize the system for the no-conflict case, where transactions aren't going to try to touch the same thing or modify the same thing, and therefore, uh, we, we can speed things up. And we'll have to check at the end to whether that assumption was correct or not, like when a transaction commits to see whether it actually violated serializable ordering. But at least now when they run, they can run as, uh, without having to take a heavyweight lock in the lock manager like we talked about last time. So the way we're going to do this is through what's called timestamp ordering and current protocols. Again, there's basically, or there, not basically, there are two categories of concurrent protocols. There's the pessimistic ones that use locking, and then there's these optimistic ones, and the backbone for how they work is typically done through timestamps. So now what's going to happen is the database system is going to assign timestamps to transactions, uh, and it's going to use that to determine the, the, the order in which they're allowed to commit. And because we, if we order the, the, the timestamps in a correct way, or if they're assigned the timestamps to the transactions allowed to commit in a certain way, then we can guarantee that we uh, generate schedules in our system that are equivalent to a serial schedule, or complex serializable schedule, right? So the way this is going to work is now timestamps are going to permeate all throughout the system, meaning we're going to assign timestamps to transactions, and then we're also going to assign timestamps to objects in our database. Meaning, like for every single tuple, for example, we'll have a timestamp that corresponds to the last time a transaction accessed or modified or di did something with it, right? Remember I said there was that uh, in the very beginning of the class of the semester, we were talking about uh, the layout of pages and, and, and tuples, right? We said every page had a header about keeping track of like the slot array and so forth. And then every tuple had a header to include things like null bitmaps or what, you know, what attributes are null. We're all, we also can store timestamps in that header keep track of like what was the timestamp of the transaction that created this object or up, last updated it, right? So now, these timestamps are, uh, may not necessarily be a f actual physical wall clock timestamp, like 205 over there, uh, but it's going to be some integer that's going to be a proxy for some, again, some, some ordering of the transactions that we want to occur, right? Typically, you know, best case scenario, you should use 64-bit uh, timestamps. Some systems, like Postgres, use these 32 bits, right? So now, what we're going to say is that for a given time, uh, transaction TI, we're going to assign it a unique fixed timestamp that is always monotonically increasing in value, meaning like we can't have timestamps go up in time and then magically jump back in time, 
Again, Postgres has this problem because they use 32-bit integers for, t for timestamps. So they, if you, you run a lot of transactions, you're going to have the wraparound problem. And we'll, we'll see how to handle that next class. But in general, like, the timestamps are always going forward in time. And the reason why you don't want to use wall clock time, unless you peg it to UTC, uh, is because of what we had this, over the weekend, like daylight savings. Now time can start moving back and forth. Now your transactions are moving back and forth in time, which may have, you know, probably which, which you don't want to happen. Right? All right, so there's going to be some part of the system that can allocate timestamps to a transaction. I'm not saying when it, they're getting assigned yet. And I'm not, also I'm not saying how many timestamps you get. Just assume that we can do that. Today's class will assume that there's one timestamp per transaction. Next class, and we can actually see this in Postgres, you may get two timestamps. So the way we'd implement this, as I said, you can use the wall clock time. You can ask the, your local CPU, like, what's, what's the, the current time? Uh, again, if you make it UTC, you don't worry about daylight savings. Of course, the problem is the clocks drift. You know, that, that's hard. And then, depending on the granularity clock, if you can only measure things in milliseconds, I could have two transactions show up at the exact same millisecond, and I'm not, you know, I, I would have to wait a millisecond before I can give a new timestamp. Another approach is do a logical counter. Just, again, had a 64-bit integer, add one to it, do a compare and swap real fast. It's add one over and over again for every time a new transaction shows up. Right? That's going to be really fast. We're not talking about distributed databases yet, but that's going to be a problem when we go to the distributed database world. Because if you have a counter and another server has a counter, and they're both adding one to it, how do I keep those globally unique? So we've got to deal with that. And typically, the best approach is going to be a, a hybrid of these two. Right? We'll see Spanner later on. They actually do wall clock time and logical counters. The, uh, sorry, they do wall clock time, but they're doing atomic clocks in, in every single rack or in the data center and GPS satellites or GPS receivers on the roof. So they can guarantee you across, you know, cr across the world all their clocks are in sync, which is amazing. But most systems don't, don't work like that. Right, again, th the main thing here is I assume that there's going to be some integer that, that, that's going to correspond to the timestamp of a transaction. How we get it doesn't matter, but it always has to be marching forward in time. And we, we won't worry about wraparound. So today we're going to be spending most of our time talking about uh, the optimistic and country protocol. Now this part is confusing because the category of country, pro country protocols we're talking about today are the optimistic category, as opposed to two-phase locking with the pessimistic category. But the main protocol that everyone uses, uses in the optimistic country protocol category is called optimistic currency control. Right, OCC, but just, just you know, keep, keep that in mind, that there's a category of optimistic concurrency protocols of which the, the optimistic concurrency protocol is the main one. Then we'll deal with more anomalies that we didn't, we didn't cover last time, uh, had, called phantoms. Then we'll talk about isol isolation levels, how to actually relax the requirement for all the stuff we have to do to maintain serializability for transactions, and then we'll finish up with the flash talk from the Weaviate guys. Okay? All right, so as I was saying, the, the main optimistic protocol that everyone would use is called OCC, or the Optimistic Country Protocol. And it's a timestamp ordering-based uh, country protocol where when transactions start, the database system is going to create what we'll call a private workspace for them. And any time they read anything or, or write anything, those, 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 the reads will always get copied into this private workspace, and any writes they make will also be in this private workspace that is unique to that transaction, and no other transaction can look into that private workspace while they're running. So it means anytime I do a write, I don't acquire the lock on the global database, you know, the, the, glo the global tuple. I make a copy of that tuple in my private workspace, then update that. And I don't need locks to do that. Then now when a when transaction commits, now you got to go look in your private workspace and compare the private workspace with other transactions or the global database, the, the global state, to see whether there's, there were any conflicts that occurred uh, since the transaction started running. And again, the idea is that these timestamps time are going to tell us the order in which the, you know, these transactions are allowed to make these changes, and I'll, we'll use, them, use those to determine whether we're violating the serializable ordering. So now if there's no conflicts, then we're allowed to then apply our changes that are in the private workspace for our transaction and update the global database. Now everyone else can see our, see our changes that we've made because we've committed. So two-phase locking we discussed last class. That was invented in 1976 at IBM. OCC here is actually invented in 1981 here at CMU uh, by Professor H.T. Kung. Uh, he's no longer here, uh, 
he got stolen by Harvard uh, to fix their CS department um, back in the early 90s. Why? Well, so the Harvard CS department um, was famously very uh, old school, like in the, in the 80s. Like they were applying the, the sort of their tenure policy as they would for like other science fields at, at Harvard, like biology and so forth. And therefore, the tenure case was, was the, they, they expect you to write a bunch of journal papers. There was this guy, Phil Bernstein, who, who invented a lot of stuff we're talking about uh, in, in terms of transactions. He was like the Davis professor there. He invented all this concurrency protocol stuff. But then he wrote conference papers instead of journals. And they're like, what's a conference paper? We don't know what that is, right? So they denied him, famously denied him tenure. And their CS department was a wreck. And they, they, they took H.T. Kung from a CMU to go fix it. Um, and so, so it's gotten better over the years. But anyway. All right, so but, but he, had, he was actually not a database person. He was a networking person. Um, and I, I met him you know, many years ago, and he was a really nice guy. All right, so how do OCC work? So OCC is going to be broken up into three phases. And again, the, the authors aren't database people, so this, the terminology of what these phases are might be kind of confusing. But we're just going to go with what the textbook says and what the, the original paper says. So in the first phase, they're going to call this the read phase, where transactions actually can read and write to the database. All right, but again, any time you read and write something, you're copying it from the, uh, the you're copying it from the, the global state, the, the global database that everyone else can read from, into your private workspace. Any subsequent reads that you make on objects you've already copied in the private workspace, you read the private workspace copy of it. So this guarantees that you have repeatable reads, which is one of the anomalies we want to avoid. And then now, once the transaction says I want to go ahead and commit, you automatically switch into the validation phase. And this is where you go, oops, sorry. This is where the, the data system has to go uh, assign you a timestamp for your transaction. So they don't get timestamps when they show up. They get timestamps only when they go ahead and try to commit. And then it's going to check to see whether it conflicts with other transactions. And those other transactions could either be things that have, that have, already, that have completed in the past or actually running right now. And we'll see the, the two directions you could do. So then if you pass the validation phase, uh, then you allow us to go into the right phase, and that's where you can then apply all the changes that you made to the, to the, to the global database. And then there's going to be this right timestamp we're going to have for every single tuple to keep track of what was the last transaction that wrote to a tuple. And we're going to go ahead and update that right timestamp in the global database to be, be the transaction that we are assigned to, or sorry, the timestamp we are assigned to in the second phase. Yes? When you say like private uh, workspace, do you mean like uh, a separate space on disk, or is this something else? He says, so what do I mean by private workspace? Uh, it could, at, at this level we're talking about today, to assume that there's a memory space that we can read and write to, um, that in practice would be backed by the buffer pool, but it doesn't have to be, and the protocol doesn't care. Okay, then if, if like uh, that buffer pool is large, that's going to take a lot of like excessive memory, right? The statement is if that means that if the if the, the the workspace is large, if I update everything, would that take a lot of memory? Yes. But it's worth to do it. Is it, is it worth to do it? Like so. Uh, again, it depends. Like if if you're it's, again, there's no free lunch. Like, either I have to maintain a lock table, keep track of all the locks I've been acquired for a billion tuples, or make a copies, copies of them into my private workspace for a billion tuples, right? We'll see next class, and what you're actually impl implementing in Project 4, is you don't copy the entire tuple. You copy the, just the diff or the delta, the thing that you modified. So, yes, if, if I have a 1,000 attributes and I only update one of them, then I can just copy that, that one attribute to my private workspace, right? Postgres doesn't do that. Postgres is basically doing what we're trying to talk about here. They make a copy of the entire tuple, no matter if you only update one thing or all things. But they don't make copies of it when you do reads. In the original protocol here, you're making copies in the reads, if you want, if you want to guarantee repeatable reads. All right, so let's look at what this looks like visually. So now, first thing to point out is that now we have our, we're showing our database, and we're showing as an object and a value. That, think of the object as like the the primary key or something, right? The unique identifier, and it has some value. And then now we have this additional column, WTS, which is going to be the right timestamp. It's going to be the timestamp of the transaction that last successfully uh, wrote to this, to this record or this object. Now within our schedule also, too, we have these, these labels that correspond to the phases we were in, will be in when we, when, when we run OCC. And again, like lock and unlock from last class, this is not something the application explicitly would call. 
I'm just showing you the boundaries here to say like what phase are we in when we, when we run the OCC for these transactions. All right, so in transaction T1 starts, uh, the, when we call begin, we go ahead and allocate the private workspace. And again, assuming it's some space in memory that we, we have exclusive access to read and write to. I would also point out too that uh, although we're not talking about implementation, this would have to be also work thread safe as well because you could have multiple threads execute queries on behalf of the same transaction and they may all need to update this, this buffer space. So just because I'm showing a one transaction, don't assume that this is, in, is, is not being protected with latches as well. Right? We'd have to make sure that that's thread safe as well. All right, so T1 starts, we get a private workspace. Then we get the first, first operation is do a read on A. So again, what we're going to do is copy the, the object A from the global database down to our private workspace. Right? Including, again, including the right timestamp, which corresponds to what, you know, assuming there was some transaction with timestamp zero that, that, that inserted this record. Now we have a context switch over to T2. T2 calls begin. It gets allocated a private workspace. Then it calls read. Same thing. Goes up to the, the, the global database, makes a copy of the record, and puts it in the private workspace. And again, I'm not saying how I found A. Assume there's an index or whatever. It doesn't matter for this, at this level of the protocol. All right, so then now it enters the, the, it wants to go ahead and commit. So say it explicitly calls commit, and then we enter this validation phase. At this point here, this is when we can assign a timestamp to the transaction uh, that with, because it's going to correspond to its commit order. So this is important to point out here. T1 started before T2, right? But T2 is committing before T1. Therefore, T2 is going to have the timestamp of 1, assuming we're just, we're just counter going up, right? So the arrival order doesn't correspond to the commit order of the timestamps anymore. So then now, we, we, in this case here, we would look at the, the read set, the read write set of, of T2, which is empty, because we, we only read one thing and we didn't write anything. And we'll talk about how we do validation in a second, but, but since it's read only, there, there are no conflicts, no problems. So it's a lot of, in the write phase, it doesn't do anything, right? We just, we just blow away the, 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 the private workspace. But then now we switch back over here to, uh, to T1. T1 does, does the write on A. So again, that will be modifying the, the, the entry in the private workspace. But now we set the, the write timestamp to infinity. Because at this point, T1 doesn't have a timestamp because it hasn't started to begin the commit process. So we just set the, the write timestamp to infinity. And that's an, enough to keep track of that, that you know, that's the value that we wrote. Then now when it does the read on A, it doesn't go to the global workspace or the global database. It just reads the same entry that it, that it modified down here. And this guarantees now you have repeatable reads. I read the same thing that, that I wrote or read the same thing that I, that I read earlier. Now when it goes ahead and enters the validation phase, now the data system allocates is at a timestamp. So this, one time, this, this transaction will get timestamp two. We do the validation to check to see whether we conflict with any other transactions. Uh, and again, T, T2 is gone, right? So there's no conflicts here. So we'll go, now we get allowed to enter the write phase, at which point we'll let's, uh, overwrite the, the infinity timestamp with the timestamp we were allocated, and then we go ahead and install the change up above. So again, think about the, the, in the order in which things got committed, right? So even though, again, T2 arrived before T1, T1 read A, uh, that was allowed to happen, right? And this guy writes A, that was also allowed to happen too because if you think of like the, in the order in which the transactions are actually getting committed, even though T2 started, for T, T2 started after T1, the end state of the database as, as, is as if T2 started before T1. Right? We could do the same thing in two-phase locking as well, right? So if, if T1 took, took a shared lock on A, T2 got the shared lock on A, those are compatible, they, they can both get that. T2 goes ahead and commits, then T1 escalates or upgrades the, lo the lock to a right lock, or exclusive lock. That, you know, this would have worked just fine too. All right, so again, the read phase is pretty straightforward, like I said. All we have to do is just track all the, the, the read-write sets for every transaction and store the changes in the private workspace. If you want to guarantee repeatable reads, you have to make a copy of anything you read and put it in the, in the private workspace. If you don't care about repeatable reads, then, then you, you don't have to do that. All right? 
We're going to ignore now for what happens if we update uh, if we update records that have tuples because now or sorry, it has indexes. Because now the question would be, okay, how do I find if my index is pointing to the global the global database? How do I also know to also look in my private workspace? Um, you know, would, you basically just do an extra check to see. I know I know with the record ID of the thing I should be looking at through the index. Do I have that in my read write set in my private workspace? Yes. Yes. So let, let's say uh, T2 was reading A and then writing A. Uh, let, let's say A was a number, an integer equal to 1. Yes. Uh, so T1 would read it. So A is equal to 1 for T1. Then T2 would read 1, uh, write, let's say it's incrementing it. So it would write 2. But then T1 still think uh, A is equal to 1 and also increment it to 2? So, so your question is, yeah. what if T2 did a read on A followed by a write on A? Yeah, and, and let's say this integer is on every write is incrementing. doesn't matter. Yeah. This, again, we just see reads and writes. We don't care what you're actually doing. Right? right? Yeah. So what, what would happen here? Yeah. So we'll get that in a second. The, we, the invalidation phase, when this guy goes, goes to validate, the, we'll see this literally in the next slide. There's two ways you could look at to see whether I have conflicts. You could look at forward in time or back in time. Okay. So this behavior is only because we don't write to A. It, that, that they're allowed to commit? I mean, this, for this simple example, uh, it doesn't matter. What, the, the validation step doesn't matter whether you're going back in time or forward in time. right? If, if you add a write over here, then when this guy goes to validate, it, you know, either this guy could abort or this guy could abort, depending how we're doing validation. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Okay. Yes. So what do you mean by repeatable read? Repeatable read just means that like, if I read, he reads A up here. This guy reads A and sees the value going back, sees 1, 2, 3. If I immediately read it again, do I get 1, 2, 3? Is that, wait, are there systems that doesn't guarantee this? His question is, are there systems that, that don't care, guarantee repeatable reads? Yes. Well, end of this lecture, you'll see what, why. He says Postgres. Uh, Postgres will give you uh, gives you read committed. There's isolation levels that tell you how what anomalies you could incur, but again, they could occur. Doesn't mean there will. All right. So let me let me follow up with what he was asking. Like, okay, if you throw some writes in here. What happens? Well, again, this is this is going to depend on what the validation phase is. So again, when we hit the validation phase, again, basically when they call commit, the data system can then figure out. Okay. Are you allowed to commit? And in what order should I expect to, to commit you? So the original algorithm, what we'll talk about here today, is keep it simple. We'll do serial validation, meaning only one transaction can check to see whether it's allowed to commit through the validation phase. Uh, if you want to allow parallel validation, it's a little more extra work because now you, gotta, you have to uh, have transactions look in the rewrite set of other transactions at the same time, and you have to like, maintain latches. It may sometimes you want to order things a certain way to avoid deadlocks. Like, we, let's keep it simple, we'll just keep it serial threaded. So again, the goal of the validation phase is to figure out whether their transaction is allowed to commit and so that we can guarantee that we only allow for serializable schedules. And the two approaches are going to be, in what order do I look for conflicts? Do I look back in time to see whether transactions that I've already committed and, I missed, and, I, and my transaction missed their updates? Or am I look forward in time, meaning I'm making changes that I know other transactions in the future Again, think logical time in the future that they, they should have saw, saw but did not. So again, so keep it real simple. Forward validation is checking whether committing transaction intersects its read-write set with any active transactions that are still running but not have committed. And again, we, meaning they haven't entered that validation phase. And then backward validation is, is going back to see are there transactions that made changes that I should have seen but I didn't? And therefore, if I'm allowed to commit, then I would have violated that serializable order because then now either my entire transaction or part of my transaction is magically going back in time to a state of the database that existed uh, before I was, you know, existed bef uh, when I started running that I shouldn't be able to see because these other guys have already committed and they've already told the outside world they've installed that state. So we're going to do just forward validation, but it's... it's uh, 
I think one of the homework assignments is they ask you going backwards, but the, the, the logic basically works the same way, which is in what direction you're, you're looking at. So okay, with forward validation, we're going to assign a timestamp to every transaction when they enter the validation phase. And then if our, uh, if our transaction is, is going to commit, then there's th one of the following three conditions have to hold for every other transaction that is running at the same time. So basically, when, I, when your transaction commits under forward validation, you know what, the system knows what other transactions are, are active, and you go look in their rewrite sets, their private workspaces, and see what, what work they've done. And then for each transaction, as long as one of these three cases is true, then you, you're not conflicting with, with, with that particular transaction. And if you don't, you don't conflict with all possible active transactions, then you're allowed to commit. All right, so the first case here is pretty obvious. If my transaction, say I'm T1, I want to go ahead and commit. If T1 completes its write phase uh, before I even start completing my read phase, so I, T, say T2 wants to commit here. T1 is already committed. Uh, sorry, sorry. T1 wants to commit. T2 is, is going to start running in the future. But in, in this case here, if T1 has completed the, the, the write phase before T2 has even started, then that's the, that's the same thing as serial order, right? Again, if my transaction is going to commit today and your transaction is going to start tomorrow, like I don't know about you, can't know about you, so therefore we can never conflict, right? Now, this, this, is, this means because there may be some transactions, uh, like if I move this begin to the top, say two transactions show up at the same time, but one of them hasn't even started running at all. They haven't done anything. They haven't read anything, haven't written anything. I can't conflict with them. So it's, it's, uh, it's trivial to do. The next case would be if T1, my first transaction, completes its write phase before T2 starts its write phase, meaning it's still running, it still could be doing reads and writes on the, on the database, um, and T1 has not modified any object that's read by T2, then I know there isn't a conflict and it's safe for T1 to commit. More simply, uh, uh, simply to think about it is, I have the write set of my first transaction, T1. If the intersection of my write set with the read set of, of another transaction is the null set, then you didn't, read anything that I, you didn't read anything that I wrote. So therefore, we can't conflict. If our read sets intersect, who cares? That's fine, right? Those are commutative. But if I write to something that you, uh, that you read, which should not have happened because I haven't... Um, if I, sorry, if I write to something that you've, you've read, but you've physically read it in the past, but logically you should have read it in the future, then, then we're violating that, that timestamp ordering. So again, let's look at the example here. So T1 starts, you get begin, right? So we create, create the workspace. Then the first thing it does is does the read on A. So again, we just copy that into our private workspace. No big deal, we saw that before. Uh, now I do the write on A. And again, I install that update to A in, in my private workspace, and I set the, time, the right timestamp to infinity. Now there's a context switch. T2 starts running. It calls begin. The system allocates its private workspace. And then the first operation is to do a read on A. Again, so it's getting the copy from the global database that was created at timestamp 0. Right? It doesn't know anything about this other transaction running here. So you can't see that right yet. Now, I enter the, the validate phase for T1. And at this point here, because the right set of T1 intersects with the read set of T2, then we can't allow T1 to commit. Because again, think about what would happen. If I allow T1 to commit here, it's going to get timestamp 1. Right? So the, the state of the database is now at timestamp 1. But when T2 goes to commit, it's going to get timestamp 2, meaning it should have solved the state of the database at uh, at timestamp 2, but it really saw it at timestamp 0. Right? So it read something back in time that it shouldn't have seen. So therefore, this is a conflict. We can't allow, this, we can't, we can't allow T1 to commit. So in forward validation, we're killing ourselves because we, we well, actually, in either one, you're always killing yourself. The, the determination is whether uh, are other people going to miss changes that my transaction made or did I miss changes from other people's transactions? And so, so forward validation is making sure that other people don't miss your changes. 
So I just change it up like this. So T1 now does the begins, does the read on A, that's fine. Does the write on A, sorry, does the read on A, and then there's a context switch, T2 starts. T1 does that write. Uh, T2 does the read. Now T2 enters its validation phase before T1 does. So under the first case, T2's uh, write set cannot have any intersections with the, the read set of, 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 of T1. In this case here, this, it didn't write anything. It only read A, right? So it read the version of A that existed logically at timestamp 0. So that's fine. We, we, it, it, it's committing before T1 finishes, so it's allowed to go ahead and complete its validation. Now, there's a concept switch back over to T1. Now T1 goes through its validation phase, right? And we know it's safe to commit because T2 has completed its validation. It got timestamp 1. I'm going to commit now. T2 one, T1's going to commit. It's going to get timestamp 2. Both T1 and T2 read the, the version of A at timestamp 0, which was the latest version, for the, the, the most recent version for both of them, the most recent timestamp. So logically, the read of t done by T2 on object A occurred lo logically before the read on A by T1, and then the write on A by T1 happened after that in time, even though physically it occurred before it. This clear? Again, there's like these two notions of time going on. There's like the time in which phys things physically happen, and a time in which the data system is enforcing that they happen logically. So is this clear? Yes. Uh, during the validation, should we obtain the matches from uh, of other transactions? Otherwise, they can might concurrently read or write other things as well. This question is in the validation phase. How am I protecting the tra transactions from, from each other? Right? So I'm saying, keep, to keep it simple, assume there's a, a global latch in, or in the entire system that says th the validation latch. And only one transaction is allowed to have that at a time. So only one transaction can, can validate. In practice, you obviously, that, that would be a bottleneck, right? So yes, you, you, you protect these data structures uh, with latches to make sure that if you're reading them, they're writing to them at the same time. There's other tricks you can do, like, if you make sure that you only, if you examine the objects in lexicographical order, meaning like A, B, C, in, in that order, and then everyone follows the same order, then you don't worry about like deadlocks. Like I'm trying to acquire a latch on thing you have, and you're trying to acquire a latch on thing I have. Everyone goes and locks up in the same order. It's sort of like when we saw two-phase locking, go to the hierarchy, uh, or the B plus tree, like everyone's going in the same direction. That, that avoids that problem. But yes, you would, have to, you would have to protect each other during this period. All right, so the last case is basically the, the extended version of case one, or sorry, case two, where my transaction's committing, T, T1's committing, and I need to make sure that my, my write set doesn't intersect with the read set of the other transaction, and then my read set also doesn't inter intersect, sorry, my write set doesn't intersect with their write set. So going back here now, um, if now I do, uh, in this, say prior to this, I've already set up the database, so T1 read A and wrote to A, T2 read B and wrote, read, sorry, read B and read A. Uh, but now if I'm not validate step here, it hasn't read A yet. And I don't know whether it's going to read A, because again, I don't know that the, the queries ahead of time. So in this case here, there's no intersection between the, 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 the right set of A, sorry, right set of T1 with the, the read or right set of T2. So therefore, it's safe to go ahead and, and commit this. Right, we can go ahead and give it a, give it a timestamp. So we update the private workspace to set the timestamp to one, and then that gets applied up up here. And then later on now, when T two reads A, right, they will then see the the new version that T one installed. And again, that's okay because now again the, the timestamps are moving in the correct order uh, over time. So the, so when it goes and validates, it'll get timestamp T two. Oh, sorry, sorry timestamp two. So the way to think about, about forward validation is that, say, this transaction in the middle here is, is going to commit. So in, in, in the, sort of the, 
the physical time in which the transaction is committing, the scope and what we need to examine is since the beginning of our transaction, and then we have to look at the read-write set of all other transactions that are still running at the moment that we're committing, or that the moment that we're in the, we're in the validation step. So you don't care about what transactions ran in the past, because they've already committed, who cares? Right? So that, that, that was case one we talked about. Backward validation is the opposite. Backward validation says that, assuming T2 is one I want to commit here, uh, that I don't care about any active transactions that are still running. I only care about going back in time for recently committed transactions and checking to see whether they wrote something that I should have seen, but I didn't because the, the change that they made was in a private workspace. Like if T1 made a change, uh, made a change like to an object, say T2 reads A here, T1 writes to A here, it's in its private workspace, and then when it gets commit, committed, then it gets applied to the global database, and therefore T2 missed it. So I got to check to see, did someone write to something I should have seen if I was running in serial order, but I didn't? Yes? How do we determine which transaction to look at or do the backwards? His question is, how do you determine which transaction to look at to go backwards? So you, you would have to, you, you, basi you basically, you know what objects you, you, you read and wrote. So you go look to see in the database, is the right timestamp uh, greater than what the, right the timestamp that I saw when I brought it back in, when I brought it into my private workspace? Right? And again, in, in, uh, in the backward val validation, I don't need to look forward in time because if this transaction now commits, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to look back in time and see what it missed. Right? So you don't need to go in both directions. You, you just have everyone going in the same direction, and that guarantees you won't miss anything. Yes? Uh, this validation and like, the writing phase, does that have to be atomic? Because if we go back to that last slide, um, this one here. Yeah, if the validation for T1, that succeeds because uh, T2 hasn't read A yet. Yes. But if the write happened later on after like uh, the like, happened, like this thing. Yeah. Yeah, like, yes, yes, but like, the, the, the algorithm specifies them in separate phases, but like, you'd have to, without bringing in locks, you could, like, you, you could have like a, a way to post and say, hey, guess what? I, I'm validated. I'm about to update these things. Make sure you, you get the latest version that I'm about to put in, right? Okay. That's one way to do it. Or you just go, just put them right in. Yes. His question is, between forwards and backwards, it's one better than another? They're basically the same. Is yeah. there one that's like more commonly used than the other? His question is, is one, one more commonly used than the other? Uh, actually, I, that one I don't know the answer to. Um, yeah, m most systems are going to do 2PL, or 2PL with multi-versioning. Next class, we'll, we'll talk about multi-versioning. Basically, it's going to be almost the exact same thing here, except now that it's in a private workspace, the versions end up in the global workspace but then you use timestamps to figure out what version you should be seeing. But you can, you can still use, it's complicated, you can still use locks, or you, you can do two-phase locking or OCC with multi-versioning. And so it, the, uh, there's other considerations. There's, I, I put it this way, there's other things you, you have to worry about of how you're gonna do multi-versioning that are gonna matter more whether than you're going backwards or forwards. And we'll, that'll be next class. Yes. His question is, is it possible to assign the timestamp at the beginning of the transaction rather than at the validation? The problem with that one is you, you, if you did that, then you need to make sure that no one violates that. And I would say that it, it would open up less opportunities. For, you get less parallelism that way. Because you're basically then defining a serial order. So if I assign a timestamp when I start, let uh, me go back here to this one here, right? Because this one got the lower timestamp than the other one. So this guy starts, I give him T1. Uh, so T1 gets timestamp 1. T2 gets timestamp 2. Then I need, I need to make sure that um, when I go to commit, like, I, did, I, did I see 
what I should have seen at timestamp two, right? But then I have, in the case of OCC, I don't know about this, this right over here because that's in the private workspace. Again, depending on whether you're doing backwards forward validation. If you're doing forward validation, you could see that. And in that case, you would then have to abort because I should have read, I should have read the database at, at timestamp one because that's, that's, this guy made that change, but I didn't. I read it at timestamp zero. So that would not be conflict serializable, and I have to abort. OK. Um, so a lot to cover. So let me jump through this. This is asking you know, what he was asking for, how to do uh, serial versus uh, parallel commits. So in practice, OCC works well when the number of conflicts is low. Like if your database is huge and your access pattern for your transactions is uniform, meaning I have a billion tuples, and at any given time, a transaction, two transactions are not touching the same tuple, then this is going to be fantastic. It's going to be really fast. If all your transactions are read-only, even faster, because you're not taking share locks. Right? And then you can do what we'll see next, next class in multi-verging. You actually only make a private workspace right? if everything's read-only. Um, but of course, it's going to have like, not, all, you know, not all workloads are going to look like that. And so we made a big deal about how going and getting the locks and the lock tables was very expensive and two-phase locking. Well, overhead, the overhead of copying that tuple to your private workspace is expensive. Again, we can mitigate that by taking deltas, but still, it's, you're, it's copying memory, and that sucks. There's the right phase, the, re, the validation in the right phase are going to be bottlenecks, as we said before, because now I've got to take latches to protect data structures as I'm applying those changes. Furthermore, the, the, the cost of an aborting a transaction is way more expensive in, two, in, in OCC than 2PL. Because in 2PL, if I, can't, if I have to touch a billion things and I can't get locked for the first one uh, then, and I abort, then I really didn't waste anything. But in OCC, I would do all, you know, update all the 1 billion things, then go ahead and commit only to find out that the first thing I tried to modify, I wouldn't have gotten the lock for it anyway, and therefore I had to roll back everything. So you have to run the transaction to its entirety just to find out whether it, you know, it's, it's actually going to be successful or not. And the extreme cases, of if you have like everybody's updating the exact same tuple, right, then there's no difference between 2PL and OCC. Right? It, just, it just degenerates to single thread execution, and no protocol is going to be better. But in practice, again, depends, depends, on, the, uh, depends on the workload. OK, so for OCC and 2PL, when we talked about it, we made this big assumption that the, the database was going to be fixed size, meaning the transactions were only going to be able to read things that already exist or update things that already exist. But obviously, in a, in a real database system, we have to support inserts and deletes and updates. And so when we now allow the, the size of the data to be dynamic, this is, in, in, this is going to introduce additional problems that OCC and 2PL by themselves aren't going to be able to handle. So let's, let's look at an example now. We're actually running SQL queries instead of just read and update operations. So the first transaction wants to count the number of people in the, or, you know, records in the people table where their status is lit. Right? And it's going to do that twice. But T2 is going to assert a new entry into that table. So t T1 starts, it runs this query, it gets count equals 99. Now we have context switch to T2, it does an insert, that's fine, that's a lot to happen, right? Then I come back over here, and I run the same query again, and now I get count 100. So it's, you know, it's, it's like the unrepeatable read, where I read, I ran the same query, and I'm getting back different results, which should not happen, again, if I was running under serial ordering uh, or serializable execution, I shouldn't see that because it should be I run T1 first, I run the two queries, get the exact same value, and then T2 is allowed to do the insert. All right? So what's going on here? Well, in, in two-phase locking, it, this wouldn't work. We couldn't, we couldn't prevent this because the record that caused our query to produce incorrect results the second time you run it it didn't exist the first time we ran the query. So we can't lock something that doesn't exist because we don't know, right? We don't know what to lock it because it doesn't exist. So on our two-phase locking and OCC, this is only going to work, uh, again, the, the basic version of these protocols only work if the objects are fixed. This particular problem is called a phantom read. 
and the idea basically is that if I scan a range of, in, in, in a table, a range of values multiple times in my transaction, and in between one scan and another scan, another transaction inserts or deletes an object, then we, 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 we end up with inconsistent results, right? Like it's, think of, it's called a phantom thing of like a ghost or an apparition, like a, a data is magically disappearing, appearing and disappearing in a way that we shouldn't see if we were running in true serial ordering. All right, so there are ways to handle this. The most obvious way is just in two phase locking, just lock everything, lock the entire table, lock the entire database, lock every single page in a table, then no one can update anything or insert or delete anything, right? Of course, that's going to suck. That's going to be bad for parallelism. So the, the alternative approaches uh, will be, as we'll go through these one by one, just re-execute every scan you have when you go to commit and see whether you get the same result. And that will tell you whether somebody has, has slipped in and, uh, something before you ran last time. Predicate locks will actually, not, actually look at the logical conflicts between different operations or different queries and decide whether there's a conflict that could produce a phantom. And then index locking will be relying on indexes themselves to actually protect ranges of things. So this is going to get kind of weird now because this is now we're bringing in the physical aspects of the data structures uh, to help with logical things in our database. So in practice, the most common one, especially in the enterprise systems, is going to be index locking. Uh, it's less common to do lock everything. And again, this is something you explicitly do in, in, your, in your application, like lock the whole table you don't, if you want to avoid any, any phantoms. Um, Doing the executing the scan multiple times, that's rare. Predicate locking is very, very rare. Uh, there's only three systems that do it. And three of those systems are written by one guy. And he's German. OK. So re-execute scans. This is also, I'd say, this is probably more common in uh, in in-memory systems where scans are cheaper and the data isn't like you know petabytes and petabytes. But the basic idea is that you just track the where clause of every single query that, that, that you run. And if you notice that the, um, if you notice that the, oh, sorry, you just check, check the, 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 the where calls of every single query you run, and then now when the transaction goes to commit, in addition to doing the validation phase, if you're doing OCC or whatever two-phase locking protocol you're doing, you just rerun the scan portion of those queries to see whether there's any new, 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 new results. Right? So if I have an update query, it has a where clause, and I want to make sure I update all, all, the, uh, all these records, I don't want to run the update again when I commit. I just run the where clause and see whether I'm seeing different result sets. Question, yes? During the re-execution, there are other versions of each. Okay, this question is, when I do the re-execute scan, if I see new tuples I didn't see before, then I abort, because I know I, I, I'm incurring a phantom. Right, so, so if other people, so we're saying the same thing. If I run this, the scan query again, when I go to commit, and other people insert things while I'm, while I'm running that scan query, or before I ran that scan query, I'll see different things than when I ran it the first time. Therefore, I know a, a phantom occurred. So therefore, I conflict. Again, you only want to do this if you, if you can run the scan fast. If it's like in memory or, or a small data set, if I have to rescan a, a petabyte of data, you don't want to do that. You'll see sometimes the reverse of this, and uh, in some systems like DynamoDB and FaunaDB can do this. Uh, they call them reconnaissance transactions. Basically, you run the you run the you run all the queries first, just to see what they read and write, but don't actually make any changes. Then, when you go to commit, run it for real and see whether they actually you know that they match, and then go apply the changes and roll back if you don't. It's sort of it's it's, it's the reverse of it. Predicate locking is is. Again, this, this sort of this logical locking scheme where you look to see whether there's conflicts over a multidimensional space of the locks that transactions want to hold. Um, this is actually what System R first proposed by, you know, in, back in IBM in the 1970s, but then they deemed it like, too impractical to actually implement efficiently. Um, and there's no, real no attempts uh, to actually do this for real, except for approximations using a technique from the 1980s called precision locking. Uh, and this was first adopted by the Germans in Hyper. Um, and then DuckDB copied what they did. And then the guy that he, he sold Hyper to Tableau, 
So then he built a new system, Umbra, and then got forked off by Cedar, Cedar DB. So this one dude found this paper from like 1981 that had like 20 citations, no one ever read, that, that solved this problem. Uh, it doesn't solve it entirely, it's, you know, there's some corner cases, uh, but it, it's a good approximation. And then, you know, very few systems do this, or it's only those four I know about. All right, so what are the basic ideas? So again, say for our scan query we have for that tr transaction T1, you can think of, again, uh, in the, the, the multidimensional space, there's, just, there's some bounded region that corresponds to the tuples that could exist within this region specified by this where clause. And so it would have a logical lock on that multidimensional space. And then now we all have to do is check to see for any other query, is there an intersection between its multidimensional space and, and this space? And therefore, if they overlap, this is just a two-dimensional two projection. But if, like, if they overlap or intersect, then I know that the, they're logically touching the same tuples, and therefore that could violate the serializable ordering. Again, think if you have like a, you know, I'm showing you two dimensions here and uh, two transactions, but think of hundred thousands of transactions, all sorts of crazy queries, it becomes very expensive to do this, and that's why it's not practical. Right? In, in, in general, to, get, to do this correctly, like in its, in, uh, in its full entirety, it would be MP complete. All right, so what do people actually do instead? Well, we're, again, we're going to rely on indexes, assuming B plus trees, uh, to use them to keep track of locks on ranges of values so that we just check to see whether there, there, are, uh, there are conflicts now between you know, those ranges. So we're going sort of, to build up and go through sort of the basics of it, and we'll see how we do this and, and incorporate it back into a hierarchical locking scheme. So again, these locks, these index locks, are going to be basically the same thing as, as the tuple locks we saw last class. Right, this is why I was saying I was abstracting away whether we're talking about what the objects actually are, right? but you could assume they were tuples. But now they could actually be things inside of, the, uh, inside of your B plus tree. So the most simple kind of lock you can have is a key value lock. And this is sort of saying that within a specific value in, my, in, in the, the logical space of, of some attribute, I'm acquiring a lock on that. So now my lock manager, I would keep track of like for this given value within this range of this of this uh, B plus tree, there's there's a lock for it, right? 14 to 14 inclusive. You can have then also what are called gap locks, where you can have uh, keep track of the space in between the values within your index, and then now you can take locks on the the empty space in between them. So I can take a gap lock on 14, 16 exclusive, right? So now if anybody tries to insert 15, right, that would, that would conflict with this gap lock and I, the transaction would be protected. So then now you can combine these up into key range locks where you would have for a given key, you would, you would get the lock on that key inclusive and then the gap lock right next to it, right? So I could have a next key range lock to say on, on 14, the, and then the gap up to it, exclusive to 16. And then again, I'm showing this in the context of a single node, but obviously if you, if you, if you're, you want your gap to span multiple, or to the next node, you could do that as well. I could have a prior key lock where it's the, it's the, 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 the value 14, and then the gap that came before it. And typically you go in one direction because you don't want to have uh, weird, weird overlaps. So then now I can bring back all the hierarchical locking we talked about last time, and start taking more coarse grain locks on larger portions of, of ranges. And then within them, as I, sort of, as I go down the hierarchy, I can have more fine grain locks that are more, uh, that, the explicit locks that are more, um, that are locking in, in, in exact modes, explicit modes. So I could take a, uh, a range lock from 10 inclusive up to the gap before 16, and I'll put that in intention exclusive mode. But then inside of that, I'll take the, uh, the range lock from 14 to 16 exclusive, and I have that explicitly in, in uh, exclusive mode. Or I could take a, another, I could have another transaction come along and do a intention exclusive lock on the range. That's compatible with intention exclusive, that's fine. But then within that, I have exclusive lock on a single key. All right? So we're relying on the data structure itself to help us to identify the, or demarcate where we want to be able to uh, maintain locks or things. 
All right, so I want to bang through uh, weaker levels of isolation, and there's a bunch of demos I want to show you guys to help like, actually running real transactions, Postgres, and MySQL, and things. But we'll do that we'll do that next class because um, we want to jump to the VV8 talk. So I made a big deal for the last three lectures about serializability, how this is the gold standard in transactions. This is this is the best way to write your your database system, best way to write French transactions. Uh, the dirty secret is that in practice, most people aren't going to run with serializable isolation. Right, but I wanted to teach you that first so you understand like this is what you should, you should be striving for uh, to understand or at least have an understanding of what it means to be running things in the correct order. But then we, now we can start turning some of these things off and, and get better performance if we deem it necessary. And so by default, most data systems are not going to run with serializable uh, isolation by turn on by default. Right? Instead, there's, there's going to be these, these lower forms. And we talk about distributed databases. We'll talk about weaker levels of consistency, right? Uh, how to keep, you know, so that I, maybe I don't need to have two nodes be exactly in sync, but again, we'll worry about that uh, at Thanksgiving. All right, so an isolation level is going to specify in, in the database system what anomalies a transaction could potentially see. It doesn't guarantee it's going to see them, because if I only want to run a transaction, I'm not going to conflict with any other transaction, because there is no other transaction. But if in a highly concurrent environment, if I run at a lower isolation level, I may end up seeing some of these anomalies. And the reason why you want to do this is because if we, if we, if we do less, the system is doing less work to protect you from, from these anomalies, then there's more opportunities for parallelism and you can get better performance in exchange for potentially having wrong results. And of course, the question is, all right, how wrong can it get? Nobody knows. It depend, depends, on, depends on so many different factors. So recall the four anomalies we talked about were dirty reads, unrepeatable reads, loss updates, and phantom reads. There's a fifth one called right skew, we'll cover next class. So in this, this sort of table here, you think going from the top to the bottom, the highest isolation level that in SQL you can get, uh, at least through the SQL standard, is for serializable. Below that will be repeatable reads. And this is saying that it's all the protections of serializable except phantom reads may occur. So you don't take the index locks or don't re-execute scans that we talked about. Below that will be recommitted where you could have phantoms, you could have uh, unrepeatable reads, and you may have loss updates. And again, I'm underlying may because it depends on whether applications or other transactions could, or could cause these problems and run at the same time. And the last one, read and committed, basically says you're, you're, you're driving, out the, 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 driving out your seatbelt, all of these things may happen. Right? So just again, a simple table like this shows you that uh, with serialized, you're protecting from everything. So how this is actually implemented, again, assuming we're talking about uh, two-phase locking, if you want serialized isolation, you execute it with strong, strict 2PL with the phantom protections mechanisms that we talked about before. Either lock everything or re-execute scans or do index locks. If we want repeat or reads, then we just do everything as we do strong, strict 2PL, but then we just turn off the, the index locks. With read committed, uh, we run strong, strict 2PL, where we hold the write locks to the very end, but we, we can actually release share locks immediately. So what does read committed mean? It means, again, like if another transaction has successfully committed, I may end up reading them, their results. So I may, in that mind state, I may read A, another transaction writes A and commits, now I read A again, and I'm going to see they're right, because they, they're successfully committed. And then read uncommitted basically says, uh, you know, oh, you can do any of these things. Yes? What, why strict 2PL? Why not strict 2PL? Instead of strong strict? I mean, so though, th this, is, this is strict 2PL. Strict basically says, uh, strict 2PL is I, I hold the write locks to the end, but I can release share locks, uh, release share locks as, soon as, as soon as I'm done with something. But you still can't violate these 2PL. Like, I can't release locks and try to add them, add them back unless you run at a lower level. So I'm going to skip this. We'll, again, we'll do a demo of this, have this next class about how to actually run this and turn these things on and off. Um, you basically say, when I want my transaction to run, what, on, what isolation level do I want? And again, that's specific to your transaction. So another transaction might be running at the same time and run with serializable isolation. And you may see anomalies, and, and they won't. This is just a quick survey of a bunch of, a bunch of systems that are out there that are, and showing their first column is their default isolation levels and their maximum that they have. So the main thing to point out right here for the, the the, the top four relational database systems, SQL Server, MySQL, Oracle, and Postgres, 
none of them, are, the default for all of them is, is never going to be serializable, right? Typically going to be recommitted. My SQL actually is re repeatable read, so it has, its default is a higher isolation level. In case of Oracle, they have this thing called snapshot isolation for the maximum level. That's what I was saying before. Oracle lies to you. So if you say, I want serial, serializable isolation, it says, OK, great, here you go. But it's actually going to give you a weaker uh, isolation level that we'll see next class called snapshot isolation. There are very few systems that run with serializable by default. So VoltDB is, is a system that I help build. CockroachDB is, uh, is an open source system, a distributed system. And then Ingress was the precursor to Postgres. Like before Postgres, it was Ingress. Right? And by default, these guys are from a serial library isolation. Spanner is here from Google, and they have something called strict serializable. Well, what is that? So that's the, the, they can guarantee that the order that transactions arrive in the system is the order that they will commit. Because they're doing what he was asking before. How do, can I assign timestamps when they show up? And that's essentially what they're doing to guarantee that. Well, we'll cover this later. DB2 has something else called cursor st stability, which we haven't talked about. What is that? And we'll cover this next time. But the way to think about it is in a hierarchy like this, read uncommitted is at the bottom. Basically, it says you're driving up the seatbelt. Any anomaly could occur. Read committed is a little bit more protection. But now there's this weird two paths where we have cursor stability, repeatable reads, and then snapshot isolation going to the other path. Where, and this is basically saying there's some anomalies that can occur in snapshot isolation that can occur in repeatable reads, and anomalies occur in repeatable reads that can occur in snapshot isolation. Cursor stability basically says, like, is my, is my cursor scanning a, a table? I'll take a lock on the page, and then when, I, uh, when I'm done reading that page, I release that lock. So within the page, as I'm scanning it, nobody else can come and modify anything. So now, if you ask DBAs, or people running database systems, what isolation level they're actually running, so this is a survey we did a few years ago. Uh, to just ask DBAs, okay, for all these different isolation levels in your data system, what, what isolation level you're running at. And you can see that very few of them are running with serializable for most of their transactions. And instead, most people are running with recommitted. Can you take a guess why? Best you said best performance. No. Default. The default. There you go. <laughs> it's literally what it is. Most people don't know what it means to have serializable transactions. Or if they do know, they're not worth, it's not worth paying the performance penalty for it. So they're going to run at a lower isolation level. And again, that might be OK. All right, so finish up. Uh, as I said, every single contributor protocol that exists in the world is either going to be a pessimistic approach, where you assume transactions are going to conflict, and therefore you have some protection mechanism, like locking, to protect the objects before they're allowed to do anything to it. Or it's an optimistic approach, where you assume that there aren't going to conflict, but you still need a way to determine what, in what order should they, should they, get, uh, sh should they be allowed to commit. Right? Even if I just take them the, 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 the order based on the, the, the order that I'm going to allow them to commit is the order that they arrive in the system, that's essentially the same thing as a, as a timestamp. Right? It's just a counter saying you're first, you're second, you're third. It's the same thing. There is no other way to do concurrency protocol, at least that I'm aware of, and the literature is aware of, and other than these two basic approaches. It's like the fundamentals of how you actually do concurrent programming uh, is, is based on these, these two methods. I had one guy come up to me at, at a talk, or I gave a talk somewhere. He's like, hey, man, like, I have a protocol that isn't pessimistic, isn't optimistic, it's completely different. I'm like, sure, t go ahead and tell me, right? And it was, and it was, it was all right? There's, these are the only two things that, that you can do. And the, it sort of related to his question before, like, is one protocol better than another? It depends on many different factors, it depends on many, many different things, and it's hard, it's hard to pick one. There is, in the academic literature, some techniques to do adaptive uh, protocols where, like, if you don't have a lot of conflicts, it's OCC, and then if you notice more conflicts, then you dynamically switch into 2PL. But as far as I know, no system implements that because just implementing one of them is so hard. So in a real system like a Postgres or MySQL, to have both of them and make sure that they're both correct is, is a big challenge. All right, so next class, we're going to talk about multi-version control. And we can play a bit more around with existing systems, see how the, the isolation level affects things. Um, but multi-version is basically the same thing we talked about so far, except now in the private workspace, the, the, the versions you keep track of are in the global workspace. OK? Any last questions? Yes? Yeah, I had one question about the index locking. Yes. How, how did that prevent phantom reads? Do you just take a lock on the entire um, index that not, it can't be updated before you read it again? This question is, how, how, how do these things protect from phantoms? Yeah, do I only take latches on the 
taking not locks, locks. not latches, locks. Yeah. Right. So like I could take, so my example before, like if I had a, where status equals lit, if I had an index on, on the status attribute, then I could take a, a, I could take a, a lock on the, um, I could take a gap lock from here. So say, say this is status equals lit into whatever the next status is. And so I know that if anybody wants to come and get inserted, they would have to either be like within that gap or on, on me. Okay, yeah. So therefore, I'm protected from that. All right. Uh, so this is Etain. He is the CTO and co-founder of Weaviate. Uh, it's one of these new um, vector, index, or vector, vector databases that we've been talking about uh, earlier in the semester. And so he's awesome. Etain, go for it. The floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you. Yay. Andy Palfus said I'm awesome. <laughs> um, thank you for, for having me. Uh, I have a lot of content, so I'm going to kind of get started right away. Like this is, this is, I just copy pasted this from our sales stick. This really is just to, to tell you, like we have actual logos, like people and companies that actually use WeV8, but I really want to get into the architecture. So just skip over that. Uh, before I can get into the architecture, you should probably know what it is that people do with WeV8. And the, the most common use cases are on the one hand, semantic search. So basically, rather than searching by keyword, lexical search, exact matching, try to search by the meaning, basically create vector embeddings with, with large language models, and then search through that, that meaning. Uh, very common in e-commerce, for example. The, the other thing that you've probably heard about is RAG retrieval augmented generation. And we see this a lot in these kind of ask AI use cases. So you have like separate data sets, typically your own data, and then you have like multiple data sets where everyone wants to chat with their own data. Like think of chat with your Dropbox, your Notion, your whatever whatever kind of data you have, or your email. Email is also a super, super common one. Um, then another one is recommendations, which is something that we're just launching sort of in, in beta. The idea is like uh, recommendations need similarity search, but similarity search alone does not make for good recommendations. You see these examples of like, hey, if you like this pepperoni pizza, you're also gonna like this pepperoni pizza and this pepperoni pizza, and they're all identical because the point of similarity search is to find the, the closest match. So there's more to good recommendations, which is what we're trying to solve from an end-to-end -end perspective. And then there's a new thing. This is currently titled generative feedback loops. It's a bit of a working title and it's in, in alpha, but the idea is rather than rag, which you just apply on the retrieval side, can you actually write that back into the database? So it's kind of this, this concept of the self-updating database or maybe even the self-learning database um, where like you could say, take everything that I have in my database, translate it to Spanish and summarize it into 80 words max and just write it back into the, the database, which is kind of a, a cool concept. Uh, for, for this next slide is architecture finally, but I think architecture follows business functions and those are represented in features here. So here's a very opinionated list of um, a couple of features that I want to highlight. And this is really sort of a, a database centric kind of view on the features would probably look different depending on, on who we're talking to. But I thought like, these are the ones that you're probably most uh, interested in. It starts with object and vector storage. So something very, very simple, but the, the point here is you don't have to use a secondary system just to serve the end-to-end -end case with the, the for for the user, WeVA does not just return like IDs from a search and then you look up what the ID means in a secondary system, but it has it all in in WeVA, which has its own uh, challenges. Uh, advanced filtering support, so it's not just vector search, but you can set all kind of filters that you can set in any kind of search engine or or a DB system from simple equal to not equal filter to range filter. So like find all products in a specific price range, for example, and minority filters, which may not make sense in, in this context, uh, but will um, later when we talk about it. Hybrid search, the idea of like combining traditional keyword-based search with vector search, uh, mash it together somehow, for example, using reciprocal rank fusion. Um, WeV8 is highly updatable, which I think is in the context of databases. Yeah, like, duh, you want to update it. It's a database. Um, but for vector indexes, this is actually kind of kind of challenging. And we have one uh, real life use case where we're doing 150 million vector updates per per day in a single cluster, and that was kind of challenging to get there. And then also kind of interesting to do that. WeV8 is distributed, so you have all the good things like replication, sharding. You can um, offload certain things to cloud storage, which decouples sort of the storage and the, the compute a bit. And there is a lot of focus on performance. So whether it's SIMD optimization, whether it's algorithmic optimizations, or um, just good old dedicated indexes for specific types. Which brings me to the architecture, yay. Um, it starts with the object store, which is just, it's, it's really just a custom built LSM store. So lock structured merge, merge tree. 
Um, and we use this, I already said it, to serve objects. It has all the typical traits of an LSM tree. So you write into some sort of a memory structure. You also write into an append only write ahead lock to, to make sure your, your writes are persisted. Those are flushed into segments over time. And then you have many segments which need to be compacted over time. Uh, we have several compaction strategies for, for doing that. The default is just a sort of leveled compaction. If you've ever played the game uh, 2048, where you like combine tiles and they have to match the sum, it's kind of exactly like this. That's my, my favorite example to, to explain leveled compaction. Uh, but also one one that we've seen in this, this case with a lot of updates, for example, is um, if you have a lot of data and you have a lot of updates, a regular level compaction may not be enough to free the disk space if a lot of data is overwritten constantly, which is why we introduced an in-place compaction strategy to sort of remove something that's deleted in a future segment without requiring two segments to be merged. Then for filters, uh, there's a lot of bitmap indexes. And it's basically an inverted index that builds on that same LSM store that we just talked about. But rather than serving key value objects, it serves bitmaps. And these are basically the, the posting lists, you would call them in, in, in search, of everything that's matched by a specific filter. And um, even if the lists get very long, like if a sim single filter matches millions or hundreds of millions of objects, this is still very, very cheap to initialize because because it's basically a, a zero copy operation, um, which, which, yeah, you just read it as fast as you can read it from disk. Um, is sort of how, fa how fast you can in initialize it. And this is also an LSM store. So basically, if you have in like future segments or in, in, in multiple consecutive segments, if you have um, the, the same key, but different IDs for this key, then you have kind of a merge strategy. In this example here, um, basically the, the merge result after a compaction is the content of both lists. And then of course you also need to be able to delete it. Um, so in this example, sort of we, we merge the lists, but also um, remove one ID and then you end up with the, the final one. Um, Next one is range indexes. So in, in e-commerce, uh, for example, you don't just have these, these exact match filters, but you, have, you could have something like, give me all the items priced between $5 and $500. And a classical inverted index would really struggle with this because it could have like almost infinite number of combinations, depending on your float precision, um, of, of different values that are matched. Um, and the way that we're, we're solving this is with a bit sliced index, which is kind of sort of turning this around rather than indexing the value, you index the individual bits. So for a 64 bit number, that basically means you end up with, um, with 64 bit maps, which is kind of a trade off. That means for any lookup, you always need to merge 64 bit maps, but it no longer depends on the, the number of, of matches made. And this is a similar concept that's also in, in Apache uh, Pino, for example. Shout out to our friends from StarTree who, who also um, talked about this concept in the, in the CMU database retreat. And feature base also have that. And both, both of those uh, databases have really cool blog posts about it if you're, if you're interested in, in reading more on this. Then we have the BM25 index, um, which we, we use for hybrid search which is basically BM25 is an established algorithm for, for keyword search similar, uh, similarity. Before there was such a thing as semantic search, it was the search algorithm. But for us in the context of vector search, we mainly use it to like overcome limitations of, of vector search. Like if a model doesn't know a specific keyword or so because it hasn't been trained on it, then we can aid it with hybrid search. For this, we have a disk-based index, and there's there are a couple of sort of um, well-known pruning algorithms. Uh, one of them is WAND, which is the one that we're using right now, um, which allows you to not score something that can't move the needle anymore in a in a way, um, which is good but not perfect. Which is why we're we're just rewriting it to use block max WAND. Same idea. You don't want to score something um, that can't move the the needle, but you're skipping entire blocks. And the reason that that uh, we want to skip entire blocks is that because then we don't even need to read a, doc, a, a block from disk. We don't even need to decode it, decompress it, don't need to copy anything. And that makes the whole thing a lot more, more efficient. Now, everything that we talked about so far was not really vector database specific, but now we come into the, the vector database part. Um, we're using HNSW, which you've probably heard of. Um, it's either people consider it state of the art or if not, then sort of variations that also um, are graph-based vector indexes are considered state of the art. And they're basically just similarity graphs. So something that's close in the vector space is also close in that in that graph. And that's the most commonly used one in, in Weeb8. And Weeb8's implementation differs a tiny bit from the, the um, sort of paper and reference, uh, reference implementation in two areas. One is 
the support for a large number of updates and deletes that we talked about, which is mainly sort of an async process that constantly repairs the graph. And it does that in a way where neither uh, latency or, or, um, or recall degrades. And this is highly parallelizable. So this is in a way that, that if you need more updates and you need to, like your repairs are not keeping up, you just add more threats. And that is something that, that I think is pretty unique to WeV8 and allows us to, to support cases that have so many updates. And then the coolest one, which we added lately, and this is where I'm finally getting to minority filters, is in-place filtering. So maybe you've heard of the uh, ACORN paper. The, the general idea is um, that you want to make filtered search more more efficient with this minority uh, filter problem. So, so basically, or you want to overcome the minority filter problem. And what that problem is, is in that graph, if you, if you only allow a certain subset of points based on some hard filter condition, like a price condition, but those are not necessarily the closest matches semantically, then one of two things is going to happen. Either your quality drops because you ignore those points that are not in your allowed list, and then your graph is not connected well enough anymore. So basically your, your recall drops, or you don't skip those points, you still follow the points, but then in a later step, and this is why some people would call that post-filtering, in a later step, step, you actually prune those, those points that you need it again, because they're not allowed to be served because they're not matched by the filter. Um, but you still need to to navigate through them, and that just kills performance because you you need to score way too many points, um, even if you're not end up end up using them. And then what where the Acorn paper comes in, it it it's basically again a pruning strategy. It sort of takes a look at your neighbors' neighbors, and um, and evaluates those if they are on the list. And it, it avoids scoring them if you don't have to. So basically, like you use them purely for navigation to get to the point, and that that um, improves performance quite a bit. Uh, just released in, in the most recent VV8 version in 127. And then there's also this negative correlation problem, which is like if you search for luxury watches, and then you have all the semantic ma matches close to luxury watches, but then you have a filter condition like less than $10, that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Because like the, the semantically closest match for a luxury watch is going to be more than $10. So you find all these points that are not allowed. And then basically you have this, this, th this is what's called the negative correlation, because basically the, the similarity search wants to go in one direction, but the filter wants to go in the opposite direction. How do you marry up the two? And this is something where, where we has something that's also um, quite unique, which is using sort of enriching at search time. You enrich that graph with new entry points based on the list of things that are allowed. And that that sort of keeps you from, from moving in the wrong direction and uh, scoring the ones that, that are most relevant. Um, I know we started a bit late. Um, are we still good for time? This is my last slide, um, but I'm I'm also happy to skip it if we're if we're out of time. Keep going. Cool. Um, okay. So this is this is roadmap sort of what what is next uh, for for Weaviate. Um, all kinds of different directions. Um, boring stuff, but necessary stuff like enterprise readiness, our back support. And then we just talked about large scale uh, for for hybrid search. We're introducing Block Max One, for example. Then, if you're if you've heard about um, vector search in in general, you may have heard about Colbert or Call Poly, um, which are these these new algorithms that basically use um, a lot of vectors per token, and then you need multiple vectors and you need some sort of a max similarity support to to aggregate them, um, and again, sort of efficiently prune them. Um, on the efficiency and performance side, locally adaptive quantization is one that, that we're super excited about. There's maybe some of you have seen my uh, guest lecture at Brown earlier this year, where I, where I compared like different uh, quantization techniques. Um, really good to get the memory footprint down without degrading performance. So that's super cool. Generative feedback loops we call we talked about in the in the beginning already. And then um, yeah, recommendations as a service. As I said in the beginning, the idea is that you don't just want your closest matches of recommendations, but you want like actual useful recommendations. Um, yeah, that's that's it from my side. Feel free to connect and um, please also apply to us for either our summer internship positions or our our, um, our um, yeah full time positions. Okay, we'll thank give you. Thank you. Round of applause. <laughs> We're over. We have time for one question. If anybody has one. 
So of all the, the vector databases that are out there, the Weave 8 one, in my opinion, has the best blog uh, and the best doc documentation because they're very open about talking about what they're doing, plus they're open source. Uh, I don't want to name some of them. So other vector databases can be a bit coy describing what they're actually doing, and they say use certain words that don't match up with what other people may call stuff. The v guys are very, very open about everything they're doing, and it's really cool. Okay? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court, and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme, and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create, rotate at a way too quick to duplicate. Fill a breeze as I skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold a real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil. Wreck still turn with third degree burn for one man. I heat up your brain, give it a suntan. So just cool, let the temperature rise. To cool it off with St. Ives.